welcome to another Untold Legends presentation where I take a deep dive into the creation and lore of our favorite fictional stories. Last time on the Resident Evil story, I detailed the creation of the survival horror classic that started it all. Its many inspirations behind the scenes, the aftermath of Rebecca's journey into the Arclay Forest, and the horrible night that Star's Alpha Team had in store once arriving in the Spencer Mansion. This time I'll be covering a sequence of events that chronicle the beginning of the end of Raccoon City. The downfall of Raccoon City is the most extensive piece of Resident Evil history. To cover it fully and in high quality detail, it's going to take a couple videos. It was the peak of Resident Evil and Capcom knew it, so they kept returning back to it multiple times and adding more and more to the events that took place. This resulted in many pieces that don't all fit quite nicely. Some as is don't fit at all. Others take place both before and after certain portions. Some are completely unclear where they take place, while some take place simultaneously. In short, the timeline of Raccoon City is a mess. I'm going to break it all down, make it more digestible, and make the pieces that don't fit quite right lock in very nicely. With this video, I'll be zoning in mostly on two games, Resident Evil 3 and 3 Make, and Resident Evil Outbreak, although some scenarios from Outbreak File Number 2 will be covered. As always, if you'd like to jump right into the storyline, you can always jump to chapter 1 in the timestamp. And a massive thank you and shout out to all of my Patreon members that make videos like these possible. If you'd like to support the channel, get your name up here on the screen with all the other greats, and get perks such as sneak peeks at upcoming content, detailed progress updates, access to the Discord exclusive channel, and early access to videos, go to patreon.com forward slash gamerthumbtv, or click the link in the description to get started. Although players experience the City of the Dead for the first time in Resident Evil 2, chronologically, it began with Resident Evil 3 and some of the scenarios in Outbreak. Although it carries a 3 next to its name, Resident Evil 3 spent much of its early life as a small side project. By the year 1998, the original Resident Evil was a big success, but the newly released Resident Evil 2 was an enormous success, elevating the series solidly and permanently into the ranks of the most legendary video game franchises of all time. Its future was guaranteed to continue after that. Capcom didn't hesitate to pull the trigger on the Resident Evil assembly line, and development on several new entries was greenlit. By summer of that same year, Capcom had started work simultaneously on the ill-fated N64 version of Resident Evil Zero, the Dreamcast exclusive Code Veronica, and an untitled game that never saw the light of day, revolving around the USS Soldier Hunk fighting the undead on a cruise ship. However, Capcom wasn't quite ready to leave Raccoon City behind. Since Resident Evil 2's creation, they always had an interest in expanding its story in a standalone project. In October 1998, Capcom's R&D Division 2 began work on this smaller budget title, with Shinji Mikami as producer and Kazuhiro Ayoma as director. Early ideas for the game centered around new survivor attempting to escape the infected Raccoon City. Around a less linear path and trigger points around the map would cause enemies to appear. Items could also be lost and the player would have to explore the map to recover them, while being attacked by enemies that would become progressively stronger. During development, the idea of a new character was dropped in favor of a familiar face. Chris and Claire were already being used in Code Veronica, so Jill was brought back to face the horrors of Raccoon City. Since the game was planned to take place alongside Resident Evil 2, telling the story before the events of the last game and finishing after its conclusion, it sported the overly complicated title, Biohazard 1.9 plus 2.1. But how would this experience be different from Resident Evil 2? Both stories did take place in the same city and time period. Early drafts of the plot put a heavy focus on the inner workings of Umbrella, including a rivalry between Umbrella's USA and European branches. Several side storylines would introduce players to UBCS troops stranded in Raccoon City, and a controversial opening would depict Jill having a nightmare in which she shot herself in the head. Interestingly enough, this is a scene directly recreated in the 2020 version of Resident Evil 3 and zombie Brad Vickers was set to be playable just after his infection. But in early 1999, production supervisor Yoshiki Okamoto decided to step in and make changes with a few requests. This new game was meant to be a lower budget side story, not a full-fledged sequel, so production costs had to remain under control. The title, Biohazard 1.9 plus 2.1, just had to be simplified. Instead, it was renamed Biohazard 3. Although it wasn't fully a sequel to Resident Evil 2, the name Resident Evil 3 kept it consistent with the other games on the original PlayStation console. 
Okamoto also requested that newer gameplay elements be dropped. He wanted Resident Evil 3 to still feel familiar to existing fans of the series, and it needed to release before the launch of the PlayStation 2. He believed that if all those tenants were followed, the game would easily sell at least 1 million copies, without affecting the momentum of the other Resident Evil titles in development. Even though Resident Evil 3 was now being designed with a similar gameplay style as the previous titles, some new additions were added. It had more of a focus on action, pitting the player against more enemies, adding a dodge function to Jill. But the fear factor was not forgotten. A new iconic enemy was designed, the Nemesis. A giant umbrella monster that would pursue Jill throughout Raccoon City. The idea was partially inspired by the T-1000 from Terminator 2 Judgment Day, a threat that couldn't be stopped, only delayed, constantly chasing its target, until the job was done. The idea was to make the player feel a constant sense of paranoia, a feeling of being stalked by a threat that could surprise you at any moment. The appearance of Nemesis introduced branching moments where the player could make different choices that would sometimes lead to different paths in the story. A first for the series, and the name Nemesis was applied to the game's title, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Capcom was confident about the game's success. They pumped $20 million worth of advertising and marketing and print ads for Resident Evil 3, Resident Evil 2 on N64, and their new series, Dino Crisis. In March of 1999, Resident Evil 3 was shown off at the Tokyo Game Show, and the beta was playable at E3 that same year. The beta version was slightly different from the final release, considering that it had a different opening with more images, and the dodge mechanic was completely absent. As release day approached, Capcom continued promoting the game by bundling a demo with Dino Crisis shipments to the West. Capcom's confidence in the project was justified. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis released in Japan on September 22, 1999, and the US on November 11, 1999. It sold more than a million units by early October, and in the US it was the top-selling PlayStation game for the first two weeks of November. Reviews were overwhelmingly positive and praised the addition of its new gameplay mechanics while retaining the spirit of survival horror. Nemesis was also seen as an impressive new threat that fans would remember fondly for decades to come. Some of the critiques revolved around the game being a bit shorter, considering it was only one disc and only had one main protagonist. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis was successful enough to warrant multiple ports across console generations, and eventually a modern reimagining in 2020, what fans typically regard as Resident Evil 3 Remake. This is the version we're mainly going to be focusing on today, considering it's the most updated version of the Resident Evil 3 story. The idea for a remake of Resident Evil 3 was considered after Resident Evil 2 Remake entered production. Fans were excited about the return to Raccoon City in a modern retelling. Capcom had already remade the first game, were working on the second game, so why not the third one too? The development codename for Resident Evil 3 Remake was Escape, in an effort to keep the project secret, an almost pointless task in today's internet. It was announced officially during the PlayStation State of Play on December 10th, 2019, put together by multiple teams inside and outside of Capcom. Capcom's own Division 1, the studio responsible for many modern versions of Capcom's biggest franchises, and the ones that replaced Production Studio 4 after a company-wide restructure. Aside from Division 1, work was also outsourced to the Capcom partner developer M2. K2, a subsidiary Capcom acquired, best known for their work on the Tenchu series, during the PS2 generation, and finally Neobards, an independent developer that's currently working with Konami on the upcoming Silent Hill F. With the modern reimagining of Resident Evil 3, Capcom took some liberties from the original version, as they did with Resident Evil 2. The story was a much more linear compared to the original, a design aspect preferred by the director of the game, Kiyohiko Sakata. Classic Resident Evil 2 had the advantage of an A and B scenario. Classic Resident Evil 3 made up for this by introducing a bonus mercenaries mode and alternate paths through the main game. In one of its earlier drafts, the story would take Jill Valentine and Brad Vickers to the Raccoon City Police Station in an effort to get information from the imprisoned reporter, Ben Bertolucci. At this point, the pair would have been attacked by Nemesis, and Jill would have passed out, only to wake up later that night and find the city in complete chaos. Instead of Jill visiting the station, Carlos and Tyrell were written in her place instead. The infamous and dastardly Nikolai was set to be a boss fight after being infected. This idea went as far as being storyboarded into an opening CG cutscene. Instead, Capcom chose to drop the infected Nikolai plot and replace the opening cutscene with stock footage and actors. A decision that's received plenty of criticism, especially when compared to the action-packed and terrifying opening of the original Resident Evil 3. And I actually noticed this the other day after watching Godzilla vs. Kong. The stock footage in Resident Evil 3 Remake of the city burning is the exact same stock footage used in Godzilla vs. Kong with the Apex facility burning. It's the same footage. You can even see the glowing blue from the crane 
burning, it's just a different angle. So yes, Raccoon City is burning in Godzilla vs. Kong. Many of the decisions made during development resulted in several critiques of this new experience. It included many new areas that weren't in the original version, however with those additions other areas were also cut. Most famously the clock tower, the park, and the graveyard, which included a boss fight with the grave digger. And the popular mercenaries mode wasn't included. Instead, another completely separate game, called Resident Evil Resistance, was marketed as the game's multiplayer mode. Both classic and remake Resident Evil 3 are seen to be much shorter than the others in the series. And Nemesis's new look also had fans mixed. His ruined face had a semblance of a nose, and he was covered in body bags instead of clothing. Sakata chose this look to make Nemesis appear more as a prototype that was quickly packaged and shipped for testing versus being a complete bioweapon. Even with its shortcomings though, Resident Evil 3 Remake reviewed mostly well. It was praised for its high production value and high intensity action. Some of the negative points highlighted the shorter campaign running time and a somewhat shallow second half. For Capcom, it was still a massive success. As of June 2023, over 7.5 million units had been sold. While Resident Evil 3 set the stage for the repeated return to Raccoon City, another game brought Resident Evil players together for the first time. Resident Evil Outbreak. Resident Evil Outbreak was the game that almost never was. The original concept for the game was conceived before Resident Evil 2 was released in 1998. Online gaming was a common practice with PC at the time. In the console world, online gaming was in its infancy. Console online gaming caught the attention of Shinji Mikami. He suggested to Capcom producer Noritaka Funamizu that he should try his hand at designing a small Resident Evil online multiplayer game. He had previously worked on Mobile Suit Gundam Federation vs. Xeon and used his experience with it to conceptualize a game with RPG style mechanics such as character stats. Levels would include small subplots involving unique conversations and items that could only be attained when using certain characters. The ultimate goal of his test game was to work together and survive for the longest time. But instead of working together cooperatively as a team, most participants ended up escaping from zombie attacks selfishly and leaving their partners behind to be slaughtered. The idea was seen as a failure since it really didn't encourage teamwork and Capcom decided that adding multiplayer would take away from the serious fear factor. Much of the tension in old school Resident Evil games involves managing your resources wisely and depending on yourself to survive versus friends having your back against the zombie hordes. The online component of the game was then scrapped, leaving the option for offline multiplayer as a possibility. But for the time being, Capcom chose to shelve the project. Years passed and the idea for an online Resident Evil game never quite disappeared. Just before the year 2002, the project was revived and given to Capcom's production Studio One. The development team responsible for many games including Mega Man X8, Marvel vs Capcom 2, even Nintendo's A Link to the Past and Four Swords GBA version. This project became a company-wide plan to create three internet-connected PS2 games, the other two being Monster Hunter and Automodelista. During a Sony press conference in February of 2002, Capcom officially confirmed that Biohazard Online was real and an in-development title. That same year at E3, players were introduced to the game's settings and new characters known outside of Japan as Resident Evil Online. Later in 2002, Resident Evil Online went through a name change, then retitled Biohazard Network or Resident Evil Network. Capcom was in full swing providing details to the gaming public, including all the different selectable characters and their backgrounds, and Resident Evil Network's communication system comprised of ad libs and gestures, pre-selected comments to coordinate with other players online in the same game. Although online chat with a mic was a possibility at the time, it was decided that players talking out loud throughout the game would ruin the atmosphere of Resident Evil. Something I personally disagree with, I think online chat would have been an excellent addition to a survival horror experience in which players have to work together to manage items and resources. Before its final release, Resident Evil Network would have significant cuts to what was originally being planned out and designed. More than 18 different scenarios were in development. New survivors in Raccoon City found themselves in various locations throughout the outbreak. The storage capacity of a PS2 DVD could only fit 4.7 gigabytes of data, and the release date deadline was quickly approaching. Cuts had to be made. 
By the time the game finished development, only 5 of the 18 plus planned scenarios were present. By September 2003, Resident Evil Network was retitled Resident Evil Outbreak, the final official title, and the idea of online gameplay was running into trouble. In America and Japan, Resident Evil Outbreak online gameplay would be simple enough. Capcom purchase servers in Japan and North America, players connect with a broadband connection via the PS2 network adapter. Very different from the console online gaming of today. You had to buy this little black box with an ethernet port that plugged into the back of the PS2. Wi-Fi just wasn't a thing. Some versions also included dial-up port and a hard drive connection allowed games to install data directly to allow for faster load times. On PC, this was all basic equipment that had existed for years. On home video game consoles, it was revolutionary. The PS2 wasn't the first to do it, but did help push the industry forward. For many players, this was the first time they were able to experience online gaming. In Europe, however, multiple complications presented themselves. Aside from the difference in running speed between PAL and NTSC region games, the European market was a vast area made of multiple languages and different internet service providers. On December 11, 2003, Resident Evil Outbreak released in Japan, in North America, March 30th, 2004. But as far as Europe, Capcom delayed the game while they attempted to sort out the online component. Unfortunately, it was an idea they decided to abandon. September 17th, 2004, Outbreak, almost six months after the North American release date, released with absolutely no online gameplay, offline only. A core component of the game was missing. Some of the negative aspects of the reviews of course criticized the European version's lack of online and the lack of voice chat, some short scenarios, but overall it received average to good reviews. Most critics enjoyed the excellent graphics, the online portion where it existed, and it was seen as a competent addition to the Resident Evil series. By August 2006, the sales numbers reported were about 1.45 million copies. Not a massive success like previous Resident Evil games, but nowhere near a failure. And that's the tale of the creation behind Resident Evil 3 and Outbreak. If you made it this far, let's go ahead and explore the story of the Raccoon City Outbreak. What happened after Star's Alpha Team escaped the Spencer Mansion? Why weren't they able to prevent Umbrella from creating more harm? And with that, I'd like to welcome you to the Resident Evil Story Chapter 3, Last Escape. Spencer Mansion Laboratory was annihilated after its self-destruct mechanism was activated. The final piece of Umbrella's Arclay facility. It appeared as if the T-Virus outbreak was stopped in its tracks. Lisa Trevor and Albert Wesker were officially presumed dead by stars. The only surviving members of Alpha and Bravo team were Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Rebecca Chambers, Barry Burton, and Brad Vickers. Although Brad was responsible for abandoning them in the forest out of fear, he did save their lives in the end, redeeming himself in the eyes of his teammates. He was flying around the forest all night long looking for them, and he provided the rockets that destroyed the tyrant. Once they arrived back in Raccoon City, Brad flew the survivors to Raccoon General Hospital to get checked out. Somehow after their horrific night, none of them experienced any serious injuries. After leaving the hospital, Barry contacted his family and learned that they were fine. In the rush to fly out to the Arclay Forest, Wesker made sure that Barry didn't have an opportunity to verify his claims about his family being taken. Everything Wesker had told him was a lie. He used Barry's family to advance his own goals, and Barry betrayed his friends for no reason. But the fight wasn't over. Umbrella had to be brought to justice. The company was still hiding its true activities right under the public's eye. The remaining STARS members reported their findings to Raccoon Police Chief Brian Irons. An argument ensued when he refused to believe their findings. He chalked it up to their imaginations or shock from whatever they experienced. It was obvious that he was in Umbrella's pocket. In an attempt to go over his head, STARS also contacted the FBI with their findings. But Umbrella had moles everywhere and ties to multiple government agencies. Agencies that were under the assumption that Umbrella was crafting weapons for the military. Chief Irons knew how dangerous the STARS team were with the knowledge they had, so he made the decision to shut them down. STARS was officially disbanded, downgrading the remaining officers to the desk duty and barely giving them work. But Chris took Wesker's betrayal personally. He was adamant that Umbrella had to go down with or without a STARS badge on. He called a meeting with the now ex-STARS members to discuss their findings in the mansion, and Chris lashed out at Barry for working with Wesker. Yet Jill stood by and defended him. At the time, Barry was in an impossible situation. 
The team discussed the T-virus, but found something much worse. Inside the documents they retrieved, they kept coming across mentions of a G-virus. Some kind of successor to the T-virus that was much worse. The data they had on the G-virus was extremely limited, but it seemed to be transmitted directly from one host to another versus being an airborne pathogen. An umbrella scientist, William Birkin, was identified as the head of the project. Everything pointed to a man that was fanatical about his research. The company's main headquarters was hidden somewhere in Europe. That would be their target. After their meeting, Chris began contacting his old connections in the military. They needed support, gear, and transportation to travel to Europe and investigate Umbrella's main headquarters. All done in secret. Chief Irons and Umbrella had the surviving STARS team under constant surveillance as they moved around their daily lives. The mission had to be taken covertly, outside of their jurisdiction. Jill, Chris, and Barry all agreed to go. The clues they had convinced them the investigation had to begin in London and continue from there. Rebecca decided that her talents could be used more efficiently on the medical side in case of future incidents. She chose to continue her medical education outside of Raccoon City, studying to receive a doctorate in virology. Before leaving the city, she wrote her official report about the Arclay incident and claimed to witness the death of Billy Cohen, so there would be no manhunt for him. Barry relocated his family from Raccoon City to Canada to keep them far away from Umbrella's eyes. After the situation with Wesker, he couldn't bear to risk their safety. Once he made sure they were moved in safely, Barry returned to Raccoon City and began seeing a psychiatrist to deal with his recurring nightmares of the Spencer Mansion. Chris needed to find a reason to travel to Europe to avoid suspicion from Chief Irons. One day inside the Raccoon City police station, he started an argument with an officer Elrand and Chris assaulted him. Irons instantly suspended Chris. The plan worked. Chris used the suspension to report that he was taking a vacation to Europe and he left a letter in his locker, making it sound like he was having the time of his life overseas. By late August of 1998, Barry and Chris boarded a plane together to head to Europe. Jill packed her belongings and left the city as a bruise to shake off Umbrella surveillance. If they believed she left Raccoon City, she could secretly continue investigating Irons and Umbrella. She planned to leave and join Chris and Barry's Europe investigation in late September. Until then, she quietly returned home and remained in contact with Brad. On the surface, he agreed with Irons that Star should be disbanded and remained a trusted officer in the Raccoon City Police Department. In reality, Brad was keeping a close eye on the chief and reported his activities to Jill. Like her fellow STARS members, Jill was struggling with the ramifications of the Spencer Mansion incident. They had plenty of information on the T-Virus, but still many unanswered questions. Was she unknowingly exposed to the T-Virus? If so, was she one of the small percentage of the population that was immune? Was it incubating somewhere inside her body, waiting to turn her into one of Umbrella's monsters? These were thoughts that haunted her in her sleep. Just like Albert Wesker, William Bergen began acting on his own plan to leave Umbrella behind. He continued his T-virus and G-virus research with a renewed obsession in Umbrella's nest facility. It was hidden deep underground in the Arclay Mountains with transportation systems stretching all the way underneath Raccoon City. To hide it, Umbrella built a chemical incineration plant above it meant to destroy hazardous waste. William Bergen was becoming more and more careless. All that mattered to him were results. He began dumping failed T-virus test subjects in the incineration plant above without taking proper precautions. The virus responded to its environment and mutated enough to begin slowly infecting the staff that worked in the facility. One by one they became sick, unaware of the contagion that was growing within their bodies as they traveled back and forth between work and their daily lives. The ground around the facility also became contaminated, affecting living organisms living within. The infection inevitably spread to Umbrella employees within Raccoon City, and reports began appearing involving violent attackers. Reports similar to the ones that prompted the initial STARS investigation. In mid-September of 1998, some police officers began experiencing symptoms of a mystery illness. Raccoon General and Spencer Memorial Hospital began taking in patients suffering from the illness. Their conditions were getting progressively worse, 
beginning with general cold-like symptoms, skin decay, mental degradation, and violent outbursts. All T-virus symptoms Umbrella had documented. Patients had to be tied down as the infection worsened, and doctors had no luck finding a treatment that worked on what they labeled as a cannibal disease. This new outbreak was still considered small, isolated to small hotspots throughout Raccoon City. Small enough that Umbrella could keep it quiet. But by September 15th, they had already begun mobilizing their biohazard countermeasure service as a precaution. On September 22nd, 1998, Raccoon City's fate would be sealed. William Birkin had been in communication with the Pentagon and was making a deal to hand over his G-Virus research. In exchange for protection for himself and his family, Umbrella spies within the U.S. government informed the company of Birkin's betrayal. After the Arclay facility disaster, Umbrella wasn't taking any chances with rogue scientists. They sent an alpha team of the Umbrella Security Service to retrieve the G-Virus samples and William Birkin. I think I didn't know you were coming. This is my life's work. I'm not handing over anything. We have our orders, Dr. Birkin. I'll ask you one more time. Hold your fire! What the fuck were you thinking? Our orders were to bring him in alive. Target resisted. We had to take him out. That's correct, sir. Roger that. Just the samples, then. Let's move. <coughs> you don't get away that easily. On the verge of death, Birkin injected himself with the still in development and incomplete G virus. It began affecting his body with monstrous mutations as his wife Annette Birkin watched him leave the lab. He would not allow anybody to steal his research. The USS Alpha team rushed out of the Nest facility with the G virus and T virus samples, but Birkin was mutating rapidly. He followed after the team outside of Nest and into the sewers of Raccoon City. He slaughtered the majority of them effortlessly while they fired on him and T-virus vials spilled during the conflict. The sewers were filled with rats, and as history has proven, rats are the perfect carriers for disease. They became quickly violent after feeding on the T-virus and devoured the bodies of the injured USS soldiers. The infected rats continued spreading the virus after traveling through the streets of Raccoon City until they made it to Raccoon's Victory Lake. Victory Lake was the main reservoir of water where most of the city's drinking water came from. After the water supply became compromised, there was no hope of containing the outbreak. The infection spread suddenly and rapidly. During the Raccoon City Sharks football game, a single infected individual began attacking other spectators. The entire stadium erupted into mass chaos as the T-virus spread from one person to another. Similar reports came in from all around Raccoon City. Hospitals were being overwhelmed and emergency services were being stretched thin from the influx of 911 calls. The 
Raccoon City Police and Fire Department began working together to evacuate citizens with helicopters leaving from the Raccoon City Zoo. Those evacuated were checked by umbrella doctors for signs of infection in makeshift hospitals outside the city. As the public outside of Raccoon began hearing details from survivors, Umbrella and the U.S. government quickly began working to cover up the truth. The U.S. government had deep ties with Umbrella, and Umbrella knew they would be the scapegoat if the infection continued spreading. The situation had to be controlled before it was too late. Civilian and much of the emergency communication lines coming into and going out from the city was cut off. National news headlines began covering the story as a possible sickness or radioactive spill of some sort. The U.S. Army and National Guard assisted with civilian evacuations while setting up military checkpoints and roadblocks on roads leading in and out of Raccoon City. And the CDC announced a 200-mile exclusion zone around it to keep anyone from traveling into the area. Raccoon City was locked down, separated from the rest of the world while the infection was contained. Umbrella sent in more soldiers from their security service to ensure that barricades weren't being crossed, and authorization was given to fire on citizens attempting to escape. Most of the soldiers were shocked and completely unaware of the actual situation inside. They only knew they were on some kind of riot control duty. The city's on lockdown. Orders are to assist evacuation of Umbrella Corp execs and government officials only. No civilians. What if they try to get past us? You're cleared to shoot to kill. Seriously? Deep in the inner city, where much of the downtown population was concentrated, civilians attempting to escape in their vehicles were surrounded by infected before they even had a chance to reach the barricades, and helicopters in Raccoon City airspace desperately searched for survivors on rooftops. Down below, even Umbrella's own ground forces were discovering the reality behind the riots in Raccoon City, after being forced to turn on their own compromised teammates. The end of Raccoon City had begun. <laughs> For the last couple of nights, violence in the city was becoming worse. Local media blamed it on riots and unrest, while the truth was quickly being concealed by Umbrella. Jill was in her final days investigating Chief Iron's connections with the company before leaving to join Chris and Barry's efforts. It was still relatively quiet outside her apartment building since the spreading infection hadn't reached parts of the city just yet. But on the evening of September 28th, 1998, the T-Virus had infected one too many. The dam was about to burst and a tsunami of infected would flood the streets. With the military blocking routes outside Raccoon City and outgoing communication cut off, the civilians inside were at the mercy of Umbrella. The situation was a perfect opportunity for Umbrella to test some of its more dangerous bioweapons. One of their greatest creations was programmed to destroy Umbrella's most dangerous enemies, the surviving STARS members. They couldn't locate Barry, Chris, or Rebecca, but Brad Vickers' current employment with the Raccoon City Police Department, the information found in his apartment revealed that Jill was still in the city, and he rushed to warn her after he escaped the assassination attempt. Hello? Jill! Are, are you okay? Brad, is that you? Listen, you gotta get out of there. What are you talking about? I don't have time to explain. You gotta get out of there right now. All right, let me grab my... Ah! Wait. 
beast chasing Jill was the Nemesis T-Type, simply codenamed Nemesis. It was the result of internal competition between Umbrella USA and Umbrella Europe. While the USA branch focused its T-Virus research into the creation of the failed T-001 Tyrant prototype and the more successful T-002 Tyrant, the European branch was aiming to solve the problem of mental degradation. A viable solution was found in Umbrella Europe's number 6 laboratory based out of France with the Nemesis Project. The research team was led by biologist Dr. Herman Frankel, who managed a small group of Umbrella scientists, including a man named Luis Serra Navarro, a man that would eventually quit the company disillusioned with their bio-experiments. Under Dr. Frankel's leadership, Laboratory 6 created the Nemesis Alpha Parasite, after being inspired by legends found within Spanish folklore. Legends that spoke of an ancient organism that would attach to the spinal cord of living creatures and control them. Parasites that were once known as Las Plagas. The Nemesis Alpha Parasite was genetically engineered to have a similar effect, intended to replace the brain function of bioweapons completely. One was shipped to the Arclay facility and implanted into Lisa Trevor, resulting in Birkin's discovery of the G-Virus. The rest were implanted into subjects in Europe. None of the hosts survive until Umbrella created genetically modified clones of the T-002 Tyrant, the T-103 line, so the T-103s were selected as the base of the Nemesis project, with mixed but more successful results. The Nemesis Alpha Parasites were implanted successfully into the T-103s and resulted in the Nemesis T-Types. The new tyrants were highly intelligent, could perform complex tasks like operating handheld weapons, and were self-aware. Two of them even attempted to escape from their confines in the laboratory until they were recaptured and disposed of. The most compliant one of them was T-02. The T-02 Nemesis was still in its prototype stage, but as soon as the T-Virus outbreak exploded in Raccoon City, Umbrella Europe hastily packaged the Nemesis up and shipped it over for live field testing. Nemesis was ordered to hunt down and destroy the remaining STARS members, and anything and anyone in its path, including Umbrella's own forces on the ground. The more it fought, the more combat data Umbrella could collect. After Jill escaped from the initial Nemesis attack, she fled her apartment, but her last escape from Raccoon City wouldn't be so easy. The city was in the early stages of a full-blown T-Virus infection. The undead were filling the streets, but she wouldn't be alone. The only other STARS member remaining in the city, Brad Vickers, would aid her and pay a heavy price for his bravery. Jill? Over here! Brad! You okay? What was that? Damn if I know. But right now it's got a hard on for the only two stars left in town. You and me. I'm not sticking around. God, this all happened so fast. I don't know. One fucked up thing always leads to another. It's like Arclay on steroids. Hey! Hey, wait! Down here! Damn it! Jill could only hope that the infection wouldn't take Brad, but her hopes were low. She saw what the T-Virus was capable of and how easily it could be transmitted. She had to get to safety, and civilian helicopters overhead were looking for survivors to evacuate from rooftops. On the way up to the rooftop of a local building, Jill ran into another survivor, an aspiring novelist but current salesman called Dario Rosso. Sir, are you alright? Uh, stay back! Don't come any closer! Hey, come on, there's a helicopter waiting to take you to safety. When the outbreak began, Dario and his family ran from their homes and were swallowed up by the hordes of the undead. They desperately sought safety through the streets of Raccoon City, but Dario's family was ripped from his arms. His mother, his wife, and his daughter were all torn apart in front of him. 
He was the lone survivor of the Rosso family. By the time Jill found him, he was hysterical. He hid inside a container and she pleaded for him to come out. Safety was just a rooftop away, but Dario was beyond reason and refused to leave his hiding place, condemning himself to the same fate Raccoon City would share. Jill could do nothing to help him, but she still had a chance to save herself by reaching the escape helicopter in time, and her now relentless pursuer was closing in on her trail. <laughs> Jill's rescuer was Carlos Oliveira, one of the many troops Umbrella deployed in Raccoon City as part of their biohazard countermeasure service, the UBCS. As Umbrella's T-Virus and Tyrant projects were coming together, they feared that one of their prototypes would one day escape. Who would retrieve and contain it? The company needed a dedicated and expendable anti-bioweapon force. Former Soviet colonel and Umbrella executive Sergei Vladimir took it upon himself to create this new private military group. The UBCS focused on recruiting men who were lost, men who needed a new purpose in life, willing to leave their old ones behind. The perfect candidates? Criminals, political prisoners, retired soldiers, mercenaries willing to fight for a paycheck. Umbrella's deep connections guaranteed they could poach any recruit they desired. Once they joined, troops would be injected with an experimental drug to keep possible viral exposure at bay. By 1998, the UBCS was made up of multiple platoons with over 120 total mercenaries under Umbrella's command. The majority of them were deployed in Raccoon City, saviors meant to give Umbrella a positive public image, and trained to enter combat zones and rescue civilians in case of a biohazard outbreak. But Jill was horrified to learn that they were employed by Umbrella. The UBCS's true purpose was much more nefarious, but its lower level troops and the commanders above them were completely unaware of the company's hidden face. As far as they knew, they were in Raccoon City to save and evacuate survivors. Hey, what do you know about that monster? Nothing. I've never seen anything like it. But it's no zombie. I promise you're in good hands. I'm with the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service. UBCS for short. Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? You guys are the ones who caused all of this! Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? Look, we're just here to help people. What's wrong with Umbrella? What's wrong with Umbrella? Oh my god. Your company is responsible for infecting everyone! Yeah. I don't know anything about all that. Corporal Carlos Oliveira served as part of the UBCS Delta Platoon's Alpha Squad as a heavy weapon specialist providing rear security. In his early years, he lived in a South American country undergoing turbulent rule. Anti-government paramilitary groups were fighting the ruling party and crime was rampant. Carlos grew up in a family of seven children, until two of his older brothers were killed in fighting between street gangs. His family suffered through the years from increasing violence in the area, and as a youth, Carlos became part of the problem. He joined a gang and began committing armed robberies until he entered a farm without permission. Carlos planned to steal anything of value he found, until a paramilitary group loyal to the government captured him during the theft. Soon after, he was rescued by a rival communist group of fighters. He was welcomed into the communist guerrilla group and trained through his teenage years. By the 1990s, Carlos was one of their most skilled leaders, but the government forces were too coordinated. Much of his group was wiped out in an attack, and Carlos was taken prisoner. 
Umbrella was interested in his skills and sought him out as part of their growing UBCS forces. They bribed the government to release him, and in the UBCS he served under Captain Mikhail Viktor, another ex-Soviet army veteran from Leningrad. After the Soviet Union collapsed, Mikhail found himself without an army to serve in a ruined economy. In the aftermath that followed, several ethnic groups fought for independence against the new Russian government. Mikhail joined one of the rebel cells where his wife was from, and much like Carlo's fate, they were dismantled by the government forces. Mikhail was jailed and sentenced to death until Umbrella presented him an offer. In exchange for the freedom and safety of his men, he would join the UBCS. He was a caring yet stern man that watched out for the safety of the troops under his command, and he was analytical knowing very well who Jill Valentine was from the intel he had from Umbrella. Carlos, you didn't even think to ask fine young lady her name? She is an elite operative of RPD, Special Tactics and Rescue Service. Her name is something Valentine. It's Jill. Nice to meet you, Jill. I am UBCS, platoon leader Mikhail Viktor. My team was sent here to rescue civilians. The train car was filled with civilians that Mikhail, Carlos, and their men had rescued. Although Jill didn't fully trust the UBCS, Mikhail welcomed her help. Having such a skilled officer on board would help them get the survivors of Raccoon City out of harm's way. Jill needed to get the subway trains powered up if they had any hope of escaping the city. The streets of Raccoon just above the subway were filled with infected. Body bags littered the streets, empty police vehicles, ambulances that never reached the hospital. The number of survivors was quickly dwindling, and anyone that wasn't already undead were running for their lives aimlessly seeking shelter. What was once a vast metropolis was now a city of the dead. A city where families used to live in peace, sports fans spectated games, and important conferences were even held. One such conference would have happened in the late October debating the future of robotics. It involved two brilliant scientists with differing opinions, an arrogant genius called Dr. Albert W. Wiley and the kind-hearted and inquisitive Dr. Thomas Light. Both men were educated at the Robot Institute of Technology, both men had very different visions of humanity's destiny. And Dr. Light one day dreamed of humans and robots working and living together, inspired by the world of the popular children's superhero, Mega Man. Were it not for the outbreak, Raccoon City would have been home to a possibly groundbreaking discussion. Jill's mission to turn on the subway train wouldn't be easy. The substation controlling power to the railways had to be turned back on after multiple parts of Raccoon City lost power. The only alleyway that led to the substation was covered in fire and the undead were breaking through fencing and barriers all over the city. Their numbers were way too vast to be contained. On the other side of the downtown square filled with shops and restaurants, Jill was able to locate an abandoned fire hose from a local fire truck and she used it to put out the blaze blocking her way and then met another UBCS soldier, an injured young man that needed medical attention. As a sworn police officer, it was Jill's duty to help. UBCS? Uh, yeah, careful, careful. <laughs> Come on, don't look at me like that, all right? I'm not an okay, no, 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 wait, please! <gasps> what the fuck? He was infected. He might have been infected. Oh, stars, this soft. No wonder so many of you dead. And what are you, UBCS, killing your own people? He would have turned. There's your sense of self pleasure Go back to the subway station. We don't need a bleeding heart like you getting in the way. The young man was executed mercilessly. In life, he was a sniper in Alpha Platoon, Murphy Seeker. Before joining the UBCS, he became an expert marksman in the U.S. Marine Corps and served during the Gulf War. But when he came home from his tour of duty, he experienced tragedy. His brothers were murdered, innocent victims of gang violence. Murphy decided to use his sniper training to become a vigilante and dispensed his own brand of justice. After gunning down at least 20 gang members, he was caught by police arrested and given a life sentence in prison. In exchange for having his life sentence commuted, Umbrella offered him a position within the UBCS where he also became a close friend to Carlos. Murphy's killer was a ruthless UBCS sergeant, Nikolai Zinoviev, another Soviet army veteran and close friend of Sergei Vladimir, with secret objectives of his own that would soon come to light. 
After Murphy's death, Jill followed the path of the substation, and she encountered a pack of dogs infected with the T-virus, just like the one she fought during the Spencer Mansion incident. Viciously hungry rabid beasts, and she discovered why the power station was out of commission. It was covered in some kind of mysterious organic substance that quickly grew over it. The only way she'd be able to turn on the power was by traveling inside and flipping the station's electrical switches manually, a task made extremely dangerous by the presence of insect-like bioweapons. Drain Demos. They were weak, covered in an exoskeleton that was cracked, and leaving plenty of muscle tissue exposed. But their numbers made them deadly. The Drain Demos were armed with sharp claws and the ability to reproduce quickly by inserting parasitic offspring down a victim's throat. If the implantation was successful, the offspring would quickly grow and tear their way out of the victim's abdomen. The only treatment that could keep someone from this fate was ingesting the green herbs found throughout Raccoon City. The reaction would cause the victim to vomit, expelling the Drain Demos offspring. The substation was now their breeding ground, where victims were taken to be fed on. Jill made her way through, blasting them quickly as they appeared, until the switches to power on the substation were reactivated, and the electrical power coursing through destroyed the hive. However, all the commotion from the station powering back on led a familiar foe to Jill's location. Nemesis had returned. Not even a direct rock and impact was enough to take the creature down. Umbrella had designed its body to constantly secrete chemicals on its skin that promoted further T-virus exposure. The result was a regenerative healing effect. As the Nemesis was damaged, its body was repairing itself. All Jill can do was attempt to temporarily disable it and slow it down, giving her just a few seconds to run away before Nemesis continued the hunt. She had to reach the Kite Brothers Railway office to set up the subway route for their escape from Redstone Street through St. Michael's Clock Tower, ending at Fox Street. When the Kite Brothers Oral and Werner opened the track in 1969, it only ran for a mile and had three stops. By 1998, it had expanded with Raccoon City to cover over eight miles of track. It wouldn't lead Jill and the others outside of the city, but at least close enough to make it to the outskirts. After preparing the path forward, Nemesis revealed another ability it was engineered with, inspired by the stories of Las Plagas parasites in Spain. had the ability to create a variant of undead. Nemesis could infuse an alpha parasite into a zombie's head. The parasite would then merge with the victim's skull and take over control of the body. The tentacles from the parasite could grab victims and pull them up to swallow their heads through its open mouth at the base of the attachment. The undead were already dangerous enough. This infection made them additional weapons for Nemesis to use against its targets. Once Jill escaped and successfully made it to the subway train with the rest of the survivors, she saw that Nikolai had joined them, but Nemesis hadn't lost her just yet. Nikolai, how are we doing? The town's crawling with those freaks. Why is she here? She's helping get the trains running again. Bad time to start getting dead weight for She's unreliable. Can't pull the trigger when it counts. Hey, take it easy. She'll get you killed. Oh, come on. Not again. It's me he's after. Hey. I'll buy you some time. Hey, wait! Wait, Joe! No! Damn it! Come on, you creepy ass stalker! You want stars? I'll give you stars! Uh. 
Jill made it into the safety of the Raccoon City sewers, but safety below the streets? An illusion. It was the home of the Hunter Gammas, an offshoot of Umbrella's Hunter Alpha program. For years, a rogue Umbrella researcher was nurturing them when the company officially deemed them to be failed experiments and ordered their termination. The Gamma variety was developed by inserting human DNA into a fertilized amphibian egg and using the T-Virus as a bonding agent, the complete opposite of the Hunter Alpha creation method. The gammas that resulted had several flaws that made them useless as bioweapons. They were extremely sensitive to warm temperatures and their mouths were easily exposed during an attack. They could swallow victims whole and did so with various sewer workers they came across. The gammas were a liability to Umbrella, however they were docile with the researcher that created them and he became emotionally attached, almost as if they were pets. He refused to get rid of them and secretly moved the gammas into the sewers to continue training and evaluating them. His end goal was to attempt to convince Umbrella's European branch that they were worthwhile specimens. What ultimately happened to their caretaker was unknown, likely becoming one of the many undead in Raccoon City. After learning that the sewers were just as dangerous as the city streets, Jill traveled to one of its many exits to meet Carlos, and she believed that she had finally lost Nemesis. Umbrella was monitoring its progress and began testing Nemesis's capability to use complex firearms in the field with supply drops. Not only was Nemesis' back closing in on Jill, he was armed with an enormous fuel tank strapped to its back and a powerful flamethrower. She had no choice but to fight while the infection continued spreading to other parts of the city that were just beginning to experience the effects of the outbreak. While Jill recovered from the encounter with Nemesis, patrons at Jack's Bar and Grill in the North Garden District of Raccoon City were enjoying their evening, while newsreels replayed reporting the earlier riot at the Raccoon City Sharks game. They were aware of increasing violence throughout the last couple of days, but on this evening, the infection swallowed the remainder of the city. Aren't you eating anything? Hey, Bob, where's your mind at? What? Immediately 
officer Kevin Ryman, Officer 153 of the Raccoon City Police Department, sprung into action and barricaded the door. He was off duty at the time and was unaware how bad the violence had gotten in other districts. Kevin was also a previous candidate for the STARS team. He'd applied but failed the screening test twice, a fact that ironically saved him from being hunted down by the nemesis. He was a skilled officer, previously winning marksman competitions, just like Chris Redfield and Forrest Fire, but his carefree attitude prevented him from fulfilling the rigid requirements of teamwork that STARS required. He was determined to try again, but on this evening, he simply wanted to drink his frustrations away. And soon, Kevin realized these were no ordinary riots. His attempts to keep the undead out failed, and they came pouring in. Survivors inside the bar ran for their lives, and Kevin gathered with three others. Cindy Lennox, a waitress working at Jack's, Mark Wilkins, a private security guard working for a local company called Skewdom Security, and Mark's fellow security guard, Bob. Kevin struggled to carry the injured Bob away from the undead horde. And unknown to him, Bob had no actual physical injuries. He was slowly succumbing to T-virus infection from the city's drinking water. Kevin bunkered down in the back of the bar and grill. With Mark, Cindy, and Bob, and he radioed in for help from its cafeteria. The few police remaining alive in the city were being overwhelmed, and his calls would go unanswered. Though Jill Valentine did hear his calls through police radio on the other side of the city. RPD dispatch, this is 153. I'm trapped in North Garden with three civilians. West side, cafeteria, back of the kitchen. One of us is injured and immobilized. Please advise. Kevin and the survivors couldn't stay in the same location. Their only way forward was to hide upstairs where Kevin could attempt to keep the infected at bay by barricading the doorways with a nail gun and wooden boards. It wouldn't last long, but it would give them enough time to find a way out of the building and out into the open streets. The group traveled through the bar's wine cellar down below that was connected to a stairway leading to the rooftop of the building, while Bob's movements and breathing were slowing down even further. He needed medical attention immediately. Once they reached the rooftop, they were immediately attacked by infected crows, and Bob knew he wouldn't make it. He already knew what was happening to him based on what he'd witnessed the last couple of days in Raccoon City, and Bob made the decision to not join the crowds of infected and become a burden to his friend Mark. I'm not gonna be someone else's burden. Bob, stop! No, you don't understand, Mark. I'm no different from them. I feel the hunger. Oh, uh, Bob. Although Bob's death was a tragic loss for Mark, his sacrifices allowed them to move quicker and escape the building through the rooftops, down to the street below, where raccoon police were guiding civilians through evacuation routes set up with barricades. Many of them were failing and police were beginning to use their own vehicles to slow down the infected. Eventually they would climb and stumble over the vehicles, and raccoon deputy chief Raymond Douglas requested Kevin's help. Chief Deputy Douglas determined that barricading the street was a lost cause, and he heroically fired into the infected while the others escaped. That's a fuel tank. Leak the gas and use it to burn these bastards. Do it now! Just inches from the explosion, Kevin, Cindy, and Mark jumped into the nearby canal and swam through the old tunnels underneath the street. According to Chief Deputy Douglas, the bulk of the raccoon's police was just on the other side, just beyond the Apple Inn Hotel where police transport was waiting. The highway was too dangerous to travel to, so the transport took side streets, but the amount of infected and barricades in the way made it impossible to continue. They had to reach the rest of the police on foot, and that's when Kevin witnessed the amazing scale of the infection. The streets were filled from end to end with these monsters, and he joined the efforts to destroy the horde with explosives. Oh. Eric! 
What's taking so long? Hurry up! I'm trying! Eric! <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Mark, and Cindy survived and traveled the evacuation route to the Raccoon City Police Department, where police were gathering survivors. The explosion from the street ruptured a gas line underground connected to the nearby Apple Inn, where three more survivors from Jack's Bar were hiding out, waiting for help. The gas line leak reached critical levels, and firefighters were unable to stop it from creating a massive fireball that engulfed the basement of the Apple Inn. It's gonna blow! Firefighters attempting to find and fix the problem lost their lives, and the fire was spreading rapidly. Inside, more survivors from Jack's Bar struggled to find a way down to the lobby so they can find an alternate way to safety. The hotel was completely compromised. When Jack's Bar was overrun, David King was simply sitting at the bar enjoying a drink. Before the outbreak, he was a skilled plumber trying to make a living in Raccoon City. Yoko Suzuki was a former Umbrella employee and current university student, struggling with memory issues. At Jack's bar, she was cutting her hair in the bathroom when she was attacked by a zombie. And Alyssa Ashcroft was an investigative news reporter working for the newspaper Daily Raccoon. She was also suffering from memory issues, a trait she mysteriously shared with Yoko. Alyssa vaguely remembered an accident that caused a hospital to close. One detail she could remember was that Umbrella was involved, and she suspected the company of illicit activities. Since Yoko had connections to Umbrella, Alyssa found this the perfect opportunity to gather details for a story exposing them. But first, they had to survive. David, Alyssa, and Yoko slowly made their way through the Apple Inn's burning hallways and collapsed stairways until they reached the first floor. The lobby entrance was completely collapsed and firefighters were attempting to break through, and the three survivors became one of the first citizens to find a bioweapon in mid-mutation, the Suspended. Originally, it was a regular citizen of Raccoon City infected with the T-Virus. Some rare T-Virus mutations affect zombies that consume a large amount of organic matter. Under the right genetic conditions, this triggers a V-Act transformation, the same process that reactivates the T-Virus inside the body and creates crimson heads. It was a process that still wasn't fully understood by Umbrella, but the secondary mutation could trigger the creation of a bioweapon Umbrella knew as the Licker. The suspended encountered in the Apple Inn was a zombie in the process of becoming a Licker, but it would never get the chance to complete its evolution. Firefighters met the survivors outside, and the remaining fires were successfully put out before the entire hotel was burned down. But the evening was just beginning. Fires were breaking out throughout the entire city. Meanwhile, Jill continued making her way back to the subway train to meet up with Carlos, and she decided to stop into a local gun shop she frequented, Gun Shop Kendo, in the Stoneville district of Raccoon City. Inside, she found the owner, another survivor that was mysteriously hesitant to leave. Come on! Shit, Jill! Kendo. You're all right. Yeah, all well, right to stretch. Sorry, I got a little jumpy there. Didn't know quite what to expect. No shit. Look, we're using the subway to get people out of town. You in? Subway. Well, that's good thinking. When we get out, there's gonna be a lot to do. We could use a man of your skill set. What's wrong? Nothing. Just a, uh, just bad timing is all. Look, uh, don't worry about me. I'm gonna make other arrangements, okay? Robert Kendo was a close friend of Jill's. In fact, he was a close friend of Star's members in general, especially Barry Burton, who often shared drinks with him at Jack's bar, and they went fishing together. 
Robert Kendo supplied stars with specially modified custom weapons and spent the early hours of the outbreak handing weapons out to civilians free of charge. Robert Kendo was the salesman, but his brother Joseph was the craftsman behind the scenes. Joseph Kendo was a skilled gunsmith based out of San Francisco that made a name for himself supplying law enforcement with specially designed firearms. After Jill passed through Kendo's gun shop, she learned that the nemesis did not burn to a crisp as she believed. alive and well, and Umbrella had just supplied it with more firepower, a rocket launcher. Jill was reunited with Carlos and Kevin's group of survivors had made it to the Raccoon City Police Department. Survivors were hiding in the underground parking lot, and for now the undead were mostly outside, although a few were slipping in with increasing frequency. With the chaos happening outside and emergency services stretched thin, the chain of command was unclear and mostly broken. Raccoon Police Lieutenant Marvin Brana gathered the remaining officers inside and took charge of the situation. The police station gave survivors the illusion of safety, but he knew the structure was a death trap waiting to be compromised. The entire area was surrounded by the undead, and they were closing in. Lieutenant Branagh recalled that the police department used to be an art museum, and began studying the old blueprints to find any hidden tunnels that could provide an escape. According to the plans, the statue in the lobby was constructed over an old tunnel system, and he formed a search party to discover how to access the passage. Then he sent a message via police communication to a new police officer under his command that was supposed to report in for duty, Officer Leon Scott Kennedy. He warned him to stay away from Raccoon City at all costs. Kevin volunteered to join the search party alongside Mark, and another survivor that joined them, Dr. George Hamilton, a surgeon that worked at Raccoon General Hospital. The undead made the station difficult to explore since riot gas was being used to keep zombies out and barricades blocked off multiple doorways. Mark Wilkins was usually a fearless man, having served in Vietnam as part of the US Army, but now his thoughts were taken over what might have happened to his family. He had a wife and son in Raccoon City, and he hadn't been able to contact them since he escaped Jack's bar. He only wished he could embrace his family again. Eventually, the group did find the means to move the lobby statue upwards and discovered a small passage underneath. Officer Rita Phillips was the only one small enough to fit and volunteered to explore the other side. She went through searching for a safe route outside of the station, and the barricades outside had reached their breaking point. The infected were coming through in droves. The survivors went outside and kept as many at bay as they could as the fire spreading through Raccoon City lit up the night sky. And just when all hope was lost, Officer Phillips returned with an armored SWAT vehicle, but someone had to draw the horde away. Come on! Uh. Hurry! Come on, get in! Is this everyone? What about Marvin? <gasps> <laughs> Don't worry about me! Just get going! No way! I'm not leaving you behind! Whoa! Oh my god! Marvin! Lieutenant Branagh was injured in the attack 
and chose to stay behind so the survivors could escape. The police station was lost and he retreated to the medical station to stitch himself back up. He would remain as one of the lone officers assisting any civilians that came his way. Jill and Carlos returned to the subway train where they met with Nikhail, Nikolai, and Carlos' friend Tyrell Patrick of Bravo Platoon. But all their efforts to rescue civilians were for nothing when Nikolai displayed his true colors. Unknown to anyone in their platoon, Nikolai was on secret missions of his own. He was employed as one of the UBCS's highest ranking roles, the Monitors. The Monitors were the only UBCS units that provided real value to Umbrella. While the rescue civilians gave Umbrella a positive public image, the Monitors were assigned multiple special tasks throughout the outbreak. Nikolai was on assignment to witness bioweapon combat data against armed troops and report back to Umbrella with his findings. Their own hired mercenaries were simply test subjects. Nikolai was also responsible for destroying any T-virus vaccine research and was on his way to Spencer Memorial Hospital in case any researchers were attempting to find a solution to the infection. A vaccine could compromise the effectiveness of the bioweapons that Umbrella had worked so hard to create. One of his most important tasks was to observe the nemesis and how effective it was at accomplishing its goals. With each successful task accomplished, his ultimate payout would increase. Let's go! You don't really think a pencil pusher like Barton is still alive, do you? I have it on good authority. Why? Are you worried about teammates? Or something else? Funny how brainless zombies can ambush a platoon like that. Funny the gate was locked. Don't you think? <laughs> Carlos and Tyrell were completely unaware of Nikolai's betrayal and traveled together to the Raccoon City Police Department. It was now overnight, the early morning hours of September 29th, 1998. After Kevin and the others evacuated, the police station was completely silent. They arrived to find several bodies wrapped and buried just outside, and the lone Lieutenant Branagh confronting a familiar face. Brad, stop! T. Not you too! Sorry. Sorry! Shit! It's locked! You stay on the door. I got this fucker. The body of Brad Vickers lay before Carlos and Tyrell. After helping Jill, Brad tried making his way to the police department searching for help, but he wasn't immune to the T-virus. The infection spread through his body and claimed his humanity just as he was arriving, and he sealed Lieutenant Branagh's fate, biting his fresh open wound. Inside, Branagh locked himself away, and Tyrell remained at the station's computer to uncover any intel he could find and guide Carlos to the star's office. Tyrell was also born and raised in South America, but left to Europe as a young adult to join the French Foreign Legion. Eventually, he took to a life of crime selling weapons on the black market. 
Eventually, the weapons were traced back to him, and he was given a life sentence, until Umbrella arrived with an offer to join the UBCS, though Tyrell's assignment simply involved providing them data on what he witnessed. Umbrella received information that Dr. Nathaniel Bard, a doctor at Spencer Memorial Hospital, and secretly an Umbrella researcher, was possibly hiding the police station with other survivors, and the STARS office could hold the information on civilians they had checked in. Carlos and Tyrell were on a mission to find and detain Dr. Nathaniel Bard. Carlos was already becoming distrustful of Umbrella. Dr. Bard knew all of their secrets, and now they wanted him found. In reality, Dr. Bard was working on a T-virus vaccine. When the outbreak became uncontrollable, he began fearing that Umbrella would have him killed for what he knew. They would never risk a vaccine becoming public. Dr. Bard had corrupt connections within the US Congress and reached out to them to secure his safety in exchange for information. He also contacted the Raccoon Police for evacuation, but all of his calls received no answer. After Kevin's departure, more police had made it back to the station, but they would find no safety. <sighs> What was that thing? The Lickers, the final form of the suspended, were already gathering and forming a colony. Their numbers were growing throughout the city. When the Licker mutation was complete, victims would find themselves confronted with a monster with an exposed brain. No skin, no eyes, but they hunted with a keen sense of sound. Their claws were extremely sharp, but their weapon of choice was their tongue. Now an organ mutated to be strong and sharp enough to wrap around a victim's throat or decapitate them instantly. Carlos faced many of them inside the station, as well as infected everywhere. It was clear that the station was a dead end, but could still hold information on Dr. Bard's location. Once he arrived at the star's office, he found what he was looking for. Dr. Bard. Oh, thank God. Did you know how long I've been trying to reach somebody? Don't worry, we're gonna get you out of there. Just tell me where you are. I'm trapped in a goddamn hospital, surrounded by every kind of abomination. Look, just send in stars. They're gonna know what to do. No, negative. RPD's overrun too. Then figure it out! Umbrella's gone crazy. They're killing all the researchers. I am the only one who knows how to make the vaccine to stop the zombies. So you can either sit there with your dick in your hand or send, send somebody who's capable of getting me the hell out of here. You heard what he said. And we can't turn him over to the company. Well, that's not our call to make. That's Mihail's call. Now I'm going to check the computer, see if I can trace the doc's location. Respond. Yeah, what's up? We didn't make it. The train derailed. Derailed? Was anyone hurt? Jill? Everybody's dead. Mihail, everybody. Ah, oh, shit. Nikolai left us to die. Wait, what? Jill! Jill, what happened? Jill, come in! Dr. Bard was still alive and waiting for rescue at Spencer Memorial Hospital. 
All the survivors the UBCS worked to rescue were gone. Carlos set out to find Jill, but time was running out. She was confronted by a beast larger than the tyrant she faced in the Spencer Mansion. The Nemesis had rapidly mutated, another feature of its unique makeup. While Nemesis could constantly heal, its regeneration can only take so much damage. After rebuilding itself too many times, the body wouldn't be able to repair itself further triggering additional changes to its biology to make it stronger. Now the nemesis had strong bones and muscles protecting it, and an animal-like structure that allowed it to run freely, unrestrained by the restrictive bullet-resistant suit that Umbrella quickly wrapped around it. But with its ability to quickly regenerate compromised, Jill stood firm against it and was able to take it down with explosive weapons at a great cost. Taking her to the hospital. Maybe Dr. Bard can save her. All right, I'll meet you there. You hang in there, super cop. I got you. Join me next time for the Resident Evil story, part four, The Umbrella Conspiracy. After the battle with Nemesis, Jill fights for her life as the T-Virus infection spreads through her body, and the situation inside Raccoon City gets worse. Survivors struggle to find a way out of the nightmare, and Umbrella begins a massive cover-up by sending a team in to destroy any evidence of their involvement at any cost. And the United States government puts boots on the ground to uncover the truth behind the outbreak.